I was totally amazed that an illegal substance that to me was garbage was helping me medically. I was bed bound for about five years. I couldn't hold a job. I had to quit school. I was near death. I believe that medical marijuana saved my life. I see it as a kind of wonder drug of our time. What this really is, is the marijuana legalization lobby taking advantage of sick patients. Legitimate sick patients need legitimate medications. It's a medicine. If it is a medicine, how come it is not regulated through medical fields? Never in my career did I find a chemical so ill-qualified to be defined as a pharmaceutical. I think the biggest problem is you're talking about a highly impure substance. You get all this stuff that's floating around in marijuana, 488 substances, 66 cannabinoids. If you find a positive effect, then that justifies drilling down deeper and deeper to see where this positive effect is coming from. There's quite a bit of evidence that suggested that cannabis would be useful for a number of indications. Migraine and nausea and vomiting. Marijuana contains anti-inflammatory, uh, antioxidant, and probably anti-cancer compounds. We found that cannabinoids can almost completely cure uh, cancers in these mice. Do you think that there has been much of a conversation about the science? Not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. I think the political uh, controversies have harmed the research side. You would think that our policies in this country should be driven by science, but I think for the most part they're not. I'm not one for just sitting around. I got to be out, and it's outdoor stuff. I'm not much for going to a gym to work out. My physical exercise, I have to be outdoors doing it. For Point Hatfield, the mountains and rivers of Montana have always been a certain kind of therapy. Running and river guiding in the summer and teaching backcountry skiing in the winter have helped him through life's many difficulties. But the greatest challenge of his life took the outdoors away from him. It was like two days after New Year's. It just dumped two feet of snow. And a group of us skied from Mammoth down to Gardner after work. And we went out for dinner. And when we were sitting, having dinner, I just went like this and, hmm, there's a lump there. I had a radical neck dissectomy. So they cut out this side of my neck. They took out the cleidosternomastis muscle and all the lymph nodes. But the cancer came back. Two more tumors and another surgery later, it was clear Hatfield would have to endure chemotherapy and radiation. Chemo and radiation were horrible, literally horrible, because I was throwing up almost all day long, every day. I zapped every ounce of life I had in me, just about. I was just hanging on by a thread. Just like he used to, Hatfield turned to the outdoors for comfort, trying to ski a small hill in his backyard. So I got two runs of two turns in, and then that's all I could do, wake me out. Two days after that, I went cross-country skiing with my wife, and I was able to do about a mile. That's all I could do. I was exhausted. Then after the third round of treatment, I couldn't do anything. Hatfield's athletic frame melted from 160 pounds of muscle to barely 124 pounds. I used to have 15 inch arms, biceps. They went down to nine inches. I used to have thick legs. I'm skinny now. I'm not used to being skinny. Are there things that you know that kind of trigger um, your nausea and things like that? No, it just comes. Just, just like that, it just comes. And we've used the other anti-nausea medications with you. I was on Ativan. Mm -hmm. I was on Zoloft, I think Zofran too, mm -hmm. and there was a couple of steroids that I wore a patch with. I 
think it was a couple other drugs, too, that they tried. Dr. Jack Hensold is Hatfield's oncologist. He says these are common anti-nausea medications that work for most patients. We have very good anti-nausea medications now, and, and you know, I make a little bit of an advertisement for that right now. People don't get sick on chemotherapy as they used to because the standard anti-nausea medications are so good. But Point Hatfield wasn't one of those patients. It just did not work. Not at all? Not at all. Didn't alleviate anything. So what was the next step? Well, then Dr. Hensel would ask me if I would be willing to try medical marijuana. I said, I'll try anything. We've had patients who've tolerated very well, and it's done some really good things for them. Even though Hatfield had his doctor's blessing, he still needed the green light from Wendy Gwenner, the hospital's oncology social worker. We had a fair number of patients who came out of the woodwork who um, probably were users anyway and said, well, gosh, I've got cancer. Um, can I get a card? And the answer is no, you can't. Gwenner carefully evaluated Hatfield's case, just like she does with every patient, before signing off on the medical marijuana recommendation. We have to be screening you and making sure that we've used appropriate medications as first-line treatment if our anti-emetic medicines have not worked well um, and we've gone through our cadre of um, medicines, then we would go to medical marijuana. After I got the medical marijuana, it just alleviated so much of that sick, pukey feeling and alleviated the throwing up. Immediately? Immediately. Wow. Immediately. It's like it was a godsend. It was a wonderful thing. Because that throwing up all the time is not good. Right, right. I believe that the medical marijuana saved my life. I couldn't eat anything, couldn't swallow, and I think it just saved, I just think it saved my life. Five years after he was first diagnosed, Hatfield is cancer free and enjoying Montana's beauty again. Nowadays, he says the beauty isn't the only thing he loves about this state. He loves the progressive voters who passed the state's compassionate use medical marijuana law in 2004 allowing patients like him the option of using a drug at the center of a growing controversy. There's a false stigma attached to it. And I'm doing this interview to help other people. Why not? It's our job to help other people. It's our responsibility. If we can do something for people, why not do it? If something can help somebody, why not let those people have that? Impassioned pleas from patients just like Hatfield have been the spark behind a nationwide movement to allow access to marijuana as a medicine. By the fall of 2010, 15 states had passed laws similar to Montana's. This is all in direct conflict with federal law. Since the 1970s, the U.S. government has considered marijuana a dangerous drug, one with a high potential for abuse and no accepted medical use. It's known as a Schedule I drug, the most restricted category. Marijuana shares its Schedule I status with drugs like heroin, ecstasy, and LSD. Drugs that have a high potential for abuse but do have an accepted medical value are placed on Schedule II. Some of the drugs currently on Schedule II are methamphetamine, cocaine, opium, and morphine. Doctors can legally prescribe medications on Schedule II. They cannot prescribe Schedule I drugs. So doctors like Hensold cannot legally prescribe marijuana to patients like Hatfield. Instead, state marijuana initiatives carve out a gray area, allowing doctors to make a recommendation for medical use. But they do so at their own peril, since the federal government still views any marijuana use, even medical, as illegal. The government publicly says, Marijuana's not a medicine because we don't have enough studies to show it, or we don't have this, or we don't have that. And you go, well, here I am. You've been sending me this for 28 years. Every month, Florida stockbroker Urban Rosenfeld receives a tin of 300 federally grown and rolled marijuana cigarettes, complete with a legal marijuana prescription glued to the side. Does it seem hypocritical to you? Of course it's hypocritical. Of course it is. I mean, the fact that they've been giving it to me for all this time, they've given me over 120,000 medical marijuana cigarettes so far in my lifetime, in the 28 years, 120,000. 
Rosenfeld is one of four surviving public patients in a little-known federal program. I show my tin can, I show my marijuana, they go, what? What do you mean the federal government grows this? What do you mean the federal government supplies this? They have no idea. It was called the Federal Investigational New Drug Program. Since applications to the program are confidential, the exact number of patients who made it in is unknown. Rosenfeld believes he was one of about a dozen patients who received legal marijuana cigarettes from the federal government. We were able to convince the government that nothing else worked, and so they had no choice but to give it to us. Rosenfeld argued he needed marijuana to treat his terrible pain, caused by a rare disorder diagnosed at age 10. It's called multiple congenital cartilaginous excystosis, and which is, means bone tumors on the end of long bones, that whatever tumors I had at puberty will grow as I grow. They mostly grow outwardly into the muscles in the veins, stretching the muscles in the veins, making it very painful and very tender. I'd be screaming and crawling on the floor for two hours, trying to get the muscles to get back in place. And then once they finally got back in place, the, two, the muscles would be so torn that I couldn't walk for three days. On top of the pain was the knowledge that any of the hundreds of benign tumors in his body could become malignant at any time. Rosenfeld spent his youth and teen years on synthetic morphine, muscle relaxants, and sleeping pills. By age 20, he was taking more than 200 pills a month, and he was a vocal critic of illegal drugs. I hear kids talk about drugs and things like that, and I go, why are you doing drugs? I mean, look at all I have to do. You'd be thankful you're healthy. Even so, Rosenfeld finally gave in to peer pressure and tried marijuana in college. He says he didn't feel anything and decided the drug was useless and that his friends were just imagining they were high. But a strange thing happened one night while smoking marijuana and playing chess with a friend. Rosenfeld did something he hadn't done in years. He sat comfortably for 30 full minutes. I thought, well, wait a minute, in what way did I take all the narcotics and drugs I had to allow me to sit? And I thought, gee, I haven't taken a pill in six hours. Well, then how can I sit? And just then, there was my turn with the joint. They handed me the joint. I looked at this piece of garbage, because to me, it's all it was. I said, this is the only thing I've done differently. I've smoked this garbage. I wonder if there's any medical benefit to this garbage. Rosenfeld had stumbled onto another potential medical use for cannabis, chronic pain. When he joined the federal program in the 80s, he became one of a rare group of medical marijuana patients, patients who could speak openly without fear of arrest about its medical benefits. Their stories added some legitimacy to an expanding body of anecdotal evidence. Medical marijuana has grown to a point where the government looks foolish saying it's not a medicine. It is a medicine. 82-year-old retired Harvard professor Dr. Lester Grinspoon is well-versed in the anecdotal evidence surrounding medical marijuana. He's told Urban Rosenfeld's story along with many other patient stories in his book Marijuana, the Forbidden Medicine. His opinion of cannabis has come a long way since he first began investigating it as a young assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard in the late 60s. Back then, he certainly did not see it as a medicine. Uh, Back then, he certainly did not see it as a medicine. I uh, could only see from my ivory tower that lots of people were using marijuana. I had uh, a concern that uh, marijuana was a terribly dangerous, I believed it, a terribly dangerous drug. And why wouldn't he? The 1930s era film Reefer Madness was a dramatic manifestation of government and media claims about the dangers of marijuana. The film portrays marijuana smokers as delirious, insane, even homicidal. Dr. Grinspoon was gravely concerned, and he wanted to give young students the proof that marijuana was hurting them. I went into the library and started to look at this. I wanted to provide a scientific and medical basis for the prohibition. What, what was the government standing on and saying that this was uh, a dangerous drug? Psychotic reactions can happen. Marijuana is now known to initiate depressive episodes, um, delusional episodes, manic episodes, and even psychotic episodes. Dr. Eric Voth is an internal medicine physician and an addiction and pain specialist in Topeka, Kansas. He's also the chairman of the Institute on Global Drug Policy and has advised former presidents Reagan, Bush Sr., Bush Jr., and Clinton on drug policy. 
A critic of medical marijuana, he says one of his biggest concerns is the risk of mental illness, especially schizophrenia. But there are clearly patients where it kind of uncaps the psychosis. Schizophrenia is a, is a form of a psychotic illness, and uh, uncapping it in people who didn't know they had it, uh, there have been episodes, again, of people who have, have sort of uncapped and continued schizophrenic that did not have it ahead of time. Indeed, research has shown a connection between marijuana use and schizophrenia. There is also great concern over marijuana use in teens and young adults because their brains are still developing. But it's still unclear whether marijuana causes mental illness or someone with a mental illness is more likely to use marijuana. As a psychiatrist, Dr. Grinspoon's expertise was in schizophrenia, and he strongly disagrees with critics who say marijuana may trigger the disease. I think that is absurd. If you just take the fact that schizophrenia, the frequency of schizophrenia is about 1% the world around. Now, you would expect with a drug that's used as often as it is, you would expect that this, there'd be a little bleep in this. It, do, it doesn't change a bit. It hasn't changed. I, in fact, you can find as much literature about how cannabis is useful to schizophrenic patients as it's harmful. Dr. Grinspoon could not find evidence to back up the government and media reports that marijuana use leads to drug-induced violence. <laughs> and incurable insanity. He is hopelessly and incurably insane, a condition caused by the drug marijuana to which he was addicted. This substance, the most harmful thing about it, was not any inherent psychopharmacological property of the drug, but rather the way we as a society were treating uh, the people who use this drug. It's been a medicine for about 3,000 years now. It only hasn't been a medicine in this country for 68 years. I say in the scheme of things, it's been a medicine a whole lot longer than it hasn't been. Dr. Donald Abrams is a professor of clinical medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and an oncology physician at San Francisco General Hospital. He says doctors were able to freely prescribe cannabis for various ailments up until 1937. Harry Anslinger, who was a, a prohibitionist and the first head of the Federal Narcotics Bureau, uh, decided to introduce the so-called Marijuana Tax Act. Physicians in the United States knew the medicine as cannabis, and by using marijuana, he sort of did an end run around the medical community. The act imposed a high tax on medical marijuana and such onerous registration and reporting requirements that it effectively banned its use as a medicine altogether. The American Medical Association came out in opposition to the act, with Dr. William C. Woodward testifying there was no evidence the medical use of cannabis was causing addiction, and that there are evident potentialities in the drug that should not be shut off by adverse legislation. He opined that it's impossible to foresee how much the new regulations will deprive the public of the benefits of a drug that, on further research, may prove to be of substantial value. The Marijuana Tax Act delivered the final blow to a medicine that was already being replaced by the opiates and aspirin. Cannabis was removed from the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1942. The fact that cannabis was an accepted, valuable medicine in the United States for nearly a century might be surprising to the teens who grew up watching the dramatizations of reefer madness. It certainly came as a surprise to Dr. Grinspoon. I discovered when I got into the library that I, despite my training in science and medicine, had been brainwashed. Like he put his house. findings into an 80-page paper, aptly titled Marijuana Reconsidered. It was later published in Scientific American. Then his professional investigation of cannabis took an unexpected personal turn. His son Danny, suffering from childhood leukemia, had begun chemotherapy. The chemotherapeutics that he had to receive were just devastating to him in terms of the nausea and vomiting. It's a nausea that goes right down to your toenails. I mean, it's, it's really a beyond description. Even with all his prior research, Dr. Grinspoon still had no idea that marijuana might be able to stop Danny's chemotherapy-induced nausea. 
One night at a dinner party, an oncology doctor who had read his paper on marijuana related the story of a 17-year-old with leukemia who used marijuana to treat his terrible nausea. On the way home in, uh, from there in the car, my wife, Betsy, asked me, uh, don't you think we ought to get a little bit of marijuana for Danny the next time he gets... And I said, <laughs> I'm almost ashamed to say this. I said, no, 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 that would be breaking the law, and I don't want to offend the physicians, you know, who are taking care of him. Uh, and I, so I was against it. Uh, she's a rather plucky woman, and... Next time he came in for his uh, chemotherapy, she went up to the Wellesley High School parking lot, and they found his friend uh, Mark uh, and asked him if he, Mrs. Grinspoon, <laughs> wanted a little bit of marijuana. When Dr. Grinspoon showed up for Danny's chemo treatment, he was surprised to find his wife and Danny so relaxed. They were joking, and he seemed, was smiling, and no problem. Uh, he, he got on the gurney, had the injection, and whereas before, with this particular chemo, he became nauseous, fell awful right away, uh, and the race to get home before he started to vomit, and then in the bed with a bed with a bucket at his side there until it was just dry heaves. That day, he got off the gurney and he said, Hey, Mom, there's a sub sandwich on Brookline Avenue, I noticed. Could we get a sub on the way home? When he discovered Danny had smoked marijuana, Dr. Grinspoon was not angry. He was relieved. And I called the doctor, the attending who was taking care of him, and I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to stand in his way doing this again. He said, don't, don't, and don't have him do it in the parking lot. I want to see this myself. And so it went. He never had any difficulty with nausea and vomiting with the further treatments for as long as he lived, he was free of that anxiety. And I can tell you, it was not only a relief for him, it was a relief for his parents and his siblings. Uh, it was a godsend. Not surprisingly, Dr. Grinspoon has become an ardent supporter of legalizing marijuana for medical use. People who suffer from these symptoms and syndromes, depending on just how serious they are, that's always accompanied by anxiety. And to take and artificially impose another level of anxiety, the anxiety involved in doing something which is illegal, for which you can be punished, is cruel. By the 1980s, scientific interest in cannabis had begun to catch up with the personal experiences. According to a 1982 United States Institute of Medicine report, Marijuana and Health, the preliminary research, coupled with anecdotal evidence, warranted a closer look at medicinal cannabis. The report also found that marijuana attacks diseases and symptoms differently than other drugs. This offered the tantalizing possibility for drug companies to develop new, novel drugs out of the chemicals in the marijuana plant. The Institute of Medicine called for more research on these chemicals, known as cannabinoids. Even with this encouragement, research on cannabis failed to flower. There aren't many scientists or clinical investigators who are particularly interested in doing research in medical marijuana because it's such a hassle. Marijuana's Schedule One status means Dr. Abrams has to get approval from more than a half dozen regulatory bodies before he can start a cannabis medical trial. There are so many roadblocks that you have to go through. Marijuana is an illegal substance um, that I think a lot of investigators and, uh, and uh, even organizations just don't want to get involved in something that is so controversial. Dr. Igor Grant is a professor of psychiatry and the director of the California-based Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research. He says not only is the research bureaucratically difficult, it's expensive and financial backers are hard to find. You know, an ordinary uh, investigator just does not have the time or resources to do this kind of work. I mean, you really need, uh, you know, either federal or state funding or pharma funding something to, to navigate uh, this whole system. The center's research was funded by a $9 million grant from California taxpayers. The money allowed for a few legitimate small marijuana trials, including several done by Dr. Abrams, that confirmed what Rosenfeld was saying all along, that cannabis works on pain 
especially pain that does not respond to opiates. All of them, to some extent or another, demonstrated that smoked marijuana is effective in this situation for which we really don't have very good treatments. I can say that the cannabinoids are, are almost certain to be useful in neuropathic pain based on the research that we've done. But even when researchers get significant results like this, Dr. Abrams says cannabis research can still be an academic dead end. When I submit it for publication, I have found what I perceive to be a publication bias, that people are not particularly interested in publishing data suggesting that marijuana might have some benefits. All of those things, I think, sort of dampen anybody's enthusiasm to take on medical marijuana research. And scientists are not getting much help from pharmaceutical companies either. No pharmaceutical company is interested in supporting, you know, marijuana research. Because it's a naturally occurring substance out in the world, so you can't patent it per se. So the research on it is, is quite dicey. It really is. Nobody can make any money on that, that research or on that development. Even if drug companies created a novel marijuana plant drug that they could patent, doctors could not prescribe it. It's going to be a, a class one type of drug. You know, it's not going to be broadly used. And again, why do you want to spend a lot of time developing a drug that, that you can't really sell? Why would a pharmaceutical company want to get involved with something like that? I think until, uh, you know, marijuana is rescheduled, large-scale research will probably not occur. Advocates have been mired in a decades-long legal fight with the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency to do just that. In the late 80s, they made the argument that marijuana has accepted medical value and that it belongs on Schedule II. It was all the judge who my understanding was basically suggested that it be made a Schedule II. According to government documents, the DEA's administrative law judge, Francis Young, found there was incontrovertible evidence that cannabis was an effective medical treatment for nausea and appetite loss, multiple sclerosis and spinal cord injury spasms. Judge Young ruled marijuana should be moved to Schedule II, writing, the evidence in this record clearly shows that marijuana has been accepted as capable of relieving the distress of great numbers of very ill people. It would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious for DEA to continue to stand between those sufferers and the benefits of this substance. For those who were concerned about marijuana's side effects, Young ruled that as a medicine under a doctor's supervision, marijuana in its natural form is one of the safest therapeutically active substances known to man. The DEA and other federal agencies disagreed. They overruled Judge Young's decision and kept marijuana on Schedule I. But the ruling did add to growing pressure on the U.S. government to go beyond its own compassionate use program and make marijuana legally available as a medicine. The answer? Provide a pill that can do what the plant does. For years, the government had been sponsoring and funding research to put the active ingredient in marijuana, THC, into a capsule form. Known as dronabinol or marinol, the drug is a synthetic version of THC created in the laboratory. Since it did not come directly from the plant, the DEA placed it on Schedule II. They wanted to have an answer to people like me. There is a medicine out there that people can buy. They don't have to use herbal marijuana. Dr. Grinspoon says the problem is marinol does not work as well as marijuana. You take people who have used both herbal marijuana, smoked it or ingested it, and Marino or Durdambino. Every time, never an exception. Oh, I much prefer uh, herbal marijuana. It was my experience when AIDS patients first started taking Durdambinol back in 1992 that they didn't like it. The absorption when taken orally of THC is very variable and low. The gut only absorbs 12 percent, plus or minus a few percent depending on the individual. The problem with taking it through the gut, you have to wait for an hour and a half to two hours to know whether you're getting relief from the pain or the nausea or whatever it is you're trying to relieve. How does Marinol compare in all this? I was talking earlier. I mean, do you mm. feel like it's as effective as the plant or no? No. I do not believe Marinol is as effective as, as marijuana or THC. And why do you say that? I've never really seen it work. 
We've added on, it's expensive, and I've never had a patient who seemed to get much benefit from it. We really haven't had very much success with patients with Marinol for any um, side effect management. So there's something that is lost in um, with the THC in that processing. Dr. Abrams says what's lost in the processing are all the other cannabinoids in the plant, some of which are known to mitigate the high associated with THC, making the patient feel more relaxed instead of anxious. There are 400 other compounds in the plant, including 70 other sort of lookalikes to Delta 9 THC, and those are all there for a reason. They provide balance, if you will, the yin and the yang. And, you know, my opinion that you lose that balance when you remove the single most psychoactive component from the plant and, and use that as a pharmaceutical. I've used Marinol uh, on some patients selectively. Uh, I've not had any problem with Marinol. Dr. Voth says while he's not overly impressed with Marinol, he would rather have patients take a pill. He says telling a patient to smoke an illegal plant is substandard medicine. I treat a lot of sick patients with all sorts of different pain and neuropathic disorders and cancer, etc. And I cannot think of one circumstance in 27 years of active practice that I've had to say, well, it's time for you to smoke dope. I just haven't. And that includes terminal patients and hospice patients. Anyone who says that, you know, we have adequate treatments for all of the conditions for which marijuana is purported to have uh, some effect. I don't think that is a correct statement. I, I think the fact is that we have a lot of difficult to treat conditions and there may be a niche or a place for the cannabinoids uh, with some of those conditions. Oncology social worker Wendy Gwenner agrees. She's personally seen patients who don't get adequate relief from the anti-nausea drugs. And when it comes to getting patients to eat... It is far and away the best medication that we have for chronic wasting and for increasing appetite in cancer patients. There's probably nothing that works as well for appetite stimulation that we have as, as marijuana. But Dr. Hensold says cannabis does have one side effect that certain patients don't like, namely the high. Most of the side effects I worry about with patients are really the, the euphoria and the altered sense of consciousness that people get um, and whether they'll tolerate that or not. Generally, you'd consider a high as an adverse effect. So <clears throat> that adverse side effect for people who don't want to be high is really a problem. For other patients, though, the high could be part of the therapeutic effect. A 1999 U.S. Institute of Medicine report on marijuana found the drug's anti-anxiety and sedative effects could be a benefit. I can't convince myself that the psychoactive part doesn't play a part. If they feel good, that's terrific. But does feeling good lead to addiction? Absolutely. Marijuana is habituating, addictive, whatever you want to call it. Dr. Voth says marijuana has about the same addictive potential as alcohol. The 99 government report found marijuana was slightly less addictive than alcohol, with 9% of all users experiencing addiction. And marijuana does not have the extreme physical withdrawal symptoms that alcohol and other drugs do. Potential for withdrawal is, is really minimal because... Uh, the cannabinoids are stored in fat so that if you stop using marijuana abruptly, it still leaches out from fat over a number of days so you don't get a precipitous withdrawal. Regardless of the mild withdrawal symptoms, Dr. Voth believes marijuana's side effects and its addictive potential are just a few of the factors that make it unattractive for drug companies to research. I think it's very unlikely that marijuana <clears throat> will ever make it through the FDA. It's the fact that you're smoking dope that you're smoking a plant. You're smoking something with 488 substances in it. So there's the rub. Schedule 1 is a side issue. It may chill things a little, but it's really that you're looking at smoking dope at, as a medication. Dr. Voth is not the only one concerned about smoking. The 99 Institute of Medicine report says smoked marijuana is a crude THC delivery system that also delivers harmful substances. There's a lot of things that have hit the, the literature that have talked about head and neck tumors, for instance, um, oral tumors, 
lung cancers even. The Institute of Medicine found that marijuana smoke can deposit up to four times the amount of tar in the lungs of a cannabis smoker as a tobacco smoker. Studies have also shown that marijuana smoke contains higher concentrations of the same carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. While scientists are concerned these factors may lead to lung cancer, they still have not found definitive proof. And patient Point Hatfield says smoking is worth the risk. The thing about smoking the marijuana is it's immediate. You don't wait 20 minutes or half an hour or whatever. It's immediate. And for me, immediate relief was a blessing. When you smoke cannabis, by the way, the peak concentration in the bloodstream occurs in two and a half minutes. When it goes through your lungs, it goes into the right side of the heart, into the left side of the heart, and then right up to the, to the brain. Most people prefer the inhalation method because they can better titrate when the effect comes on, how long it lasts. Dr. Grant says until someone comes up with a fast-acting inhaler, smoking may be their best option. I'm not sort of in the camp of people who say, well, I grant you marijuana may work, but it's absolutely unacceptable because it's smoked. Uh, I don't think that's right. Do you worry about patient smoking? I, I don't. I look at the cost benefit. The cost of having untreated cancer would be far outweigh whatever carcinogens might be introduced to the lungs. Even Irvin Rosenfeld, a patient who smokes 10 to 20 marijuana cigarettes a day, doesn't waste any time worrying about the smoke. No. Why not? First of all, I have over 200 tumors in my body that could go malignant. I should live so long as to die of lung cancer. Okay. A 2006 lung cancer study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse gives Rosenfeld even more to smile about. Researchers unexpectedly found that chronic, heavy marijuana smokers not only had no increased risk of developing lung cancer, but they actually had a decreased risk. Marijuana contains anti-inflammatory, uh, antioxidant, and probably anti-cancer compounds in it. This is where the complexity of the plant is both a blessing and a curse. With dozens of cannabinoids and hundreds of other compounds, it's difficult to pinpoint the source of the beneficial effects found in the smoking study. There are challenges in doing research on something that has, you know, 150 different chemicals in it. Critic Dr. Eric Voth believes the true medical potential of cannabis lies in targeting some of those chemicals, not smoking the entire plant. There are elements in the cannabinoids and various cannabinoids that have a lot of positive effect and very little addictive or uh, high causing effects. Scientists have managed to isolate and focus attention on one of those. It's called cannabidiol, and next to THC, it's one of the most abundant cannabinoids in the plant. CBD is cannabidiol, which is another cannabinoid uh, like the main psychoactive ingredient, but instead of getting people high, CBD seems to be a very potent anti-inflammatory and analgesic. So it relieves pain and decreases inflammation. But what I'll be judged anti-inflammatory and analgesic. So it relieves pain and decreases inflammation. But what I'll do is I'll just kind of put the stove on low. I'll spoon out a little bit of the can of butter, about, about that much as a dose is worth for the night. And um, I'll put it into the pan and just let it melt down. CBDs seem to help my seizures. I'm not using it to, to get any psychological effects off of it. I'm just eating the butter raw with bread, so warmed up. And how often do you take do you take that? Once a day, twice a day? At night, right before bed. I used to be on approximately 14 different prescriptions, and uh, I would still have up to 12 seizures a day. I used to, have to take two handfuls of pills, no more. While this 27-year-old epilepsy patient is relieved to be taking medical marijuana, she's considerably more anxious about showing her face and has requested we conceal her identity. Why do you not want to show your face? I am not comfortable showing my face because of all the discrimination that has already happened. She says both she and her husband have lost jobs when she spoke openly about her use of marijuana as a medicine. But. The fact of the matter is, somebody has to speak up or nobody will hear these stories. She chose to tell us her story in her artist's studio. 
Here, she creates much happier works than she did even a few years ago, when her self-portraits plainly showed the toll epilepsy had taken since she was diagnosed at 15. I've taken pretty much every anti-epileptic on the market, and some with a little bit more success than others. Some of the medicines I, w I was on had nothing to do with epilepsy, and the doctors put me on them to help me sleep or to help with my anxiety issues. The seizures were so bad I needed to be sedated heavily to sleep. The depression gets worse the more you're sedated. Despite the constant seizures and depression, she graduated high school and was accepted into a private women's college to study psychology and fine arts. The seizures were so intense by my early 20s that I, I couldn't stay in class. And as the stress of exams would come closer, that would trigger seizures. She had to withdraw from college just a handful of credits short of graduation. The seizures were so bad and the medication so debilitating that getting a job wasn't even an option. She was bed bound for years while the epilepsy ruled her life. My husband would have to call me you know 25 times a day from work just to make sure I was still breathing okay. Um, I could not shower by myself because if I slipped and fell you know it only takes a half inch to drown. So we were living on pins and needles with me having that many. That's when she decided to move to a state with a medical marijuana program. She had read stories about its potential to treat epilepsy and she wanted legal access to it. How did that impact your seizures? They started slowing down. I had to build it up in my system and it it wasn't until I started ingesting it that they really stopped completely. The potential of the CBDs in marijuana to mitigate epileptic seizures is not new. Scientists who put together the 1982 U.S. Institute of Medicine report found substantial evidence from animal studies to indicate that cannabinoids are effective in blocking seizures and that there is strong support for further investigation into the utility of CBD in human epilepsy. The subsequent 1999 Institute of Medicine report was less enthusiastic, saying the solid scientific evidence still isn't there yet, and it was unlikely to be a fruitful area for drug research. Well, I'm not waiting for the FDA approval to come through. It is, I know how it affects my body, and that's one thing that I've learned through taking prescription drugs all these years. I have to know how this stuff is going to affect me, not what somebody else says it does for them. Not only has it completely stopped her seizures, but she says something in the plant works for her anxiety, depression, and insomnia, too. So she sees the scientifically undesirable cornucopia of substances in the plant as a benefit, not a detriment. The fact is it works. It works better than anything I've ever tried, any pill I've ever taken. The cannabinoids have multiple actions. It's not just for on pain or, in her case, maybe anti-epileptic action, but... For, for many people, they have a sedative and any anxiety effect and so forth. I'm a cancer doctor and I often suggest to my patients that they consider marijuana for their loss of appetite, nausea, pain, depression, and insomnia. It's one medicine they could use instead of five. Critics of medical marijuana are highly skeptical of claims it can treat just about everything. How is it possible that one plant has the potential to treat so many different ailments? Intriguing answers started appearing in the early 90s when researchers pinpointed receptors in the brain and the body that bind with the cannabinoids. Receptors can be described as locks on the surface of a cell, and when the correct key binds with the correct lock or receptor, it opens the door and delivers messages. Sometimes the message is that the body is feeling pain. Other times the message may be that there's an invader and the immune system must attack. Scientists located two receptors, uh, cannabinoid receptors, one called the CB1 receptor, mainly in the brain, and the other is the CB2 receptor, which is mainly in cells of the immune system. The CB1 receptors are extremely abundant in the brain, but they're also found all over the body in the major organs, the heart, the liver, kidneys, and pancreas. After finding all these locks that accepted the cannabis key, researchers made the next big discovery. The human body makes its own cannabinoids, called endocannabinoids. We have this whole elaborate system where we have these receptors in our brain and in our immune system and these circulating chemicals that we produce ourselves that really are very, very similar 
to the chemicals in the marijuana plant. The only difference is that the endocannabinoids that we produce are in such small quantities and they're also rapidly degraded so that therefore we are not high all the time or you know we don't have that feeling of euphoria all the time. Dr. Prakash Nayagarkati is a professor of pathology and microbiology at the University of South Carolina. For the last decade he's been doing research on what's become known as the human endocannabinoid system. The precise functions of the endocannabinoid system is uh, it's still being uh, understood actually. The discovery of the system, however, is already revealing clues that have bolstered the personal stories of relief. The areas of the brain that control nausea and vomiting, chronic pain, and epileptic seizures all have cannabinoid receptors. What do these things do? Well, um, in the brain and the nervous system, the cannabinoid system seems to uh, uh, exert kind of a, a dampening effect. It's kind of an internal, I think, I like to think of it as a neurological shock absorber. And when they looked in other animals, they found these receptors were present in basically all animal species. So why do dogs and monkeys, for example, need to have cannabinoid receptors? They must be playing a very critical role in trying to uh, maintain some of the physiological functions. The whole development of the fact that there are cannabinoid receptors in endocannabinoids has really given drug companies and pharmaceutical investigators a lot of opportunity to try to manipulate uh, the body's own cannabinoid system. That's because now they can create synthetic drugs that target the receptors instead of taking chemicals from the plant. By avoiding the plant, they get around the controversies and complications of its Schedule I status. A search of the U.S. patent database reveals numerous large pharmaceutical companies have filed recent patents claiming their cannabinoid receptor drug has the potential to treat almost everything multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, rheumatoid arthritis, Tourette's, epilepsy, heart disease, obesity, various mental illnesses, and the holy grail of medicine, a cancer cure. We feel that these cannabinoids give us an opportunity to study their functions, you know, and see how we can exploit them, how we can manipulate these cannabinoids and the receptors to find cures for a large number of diseases currently in which there is particularly no cure. As an immunologist, Dr. Niagara Cotty and his researchers at the University of South Carolina are exploring the impact cannabinoids and the CB2 receptors have on the human immune system. Both U.S. reports on marijuana found the cannabinoids do suppress the immune system, and previously this was seen as a concern. But Dr. Niagara Cotty believes tamping down the immune system could be a good thing. That are seen as a concern, but Dr. Niagara Cotty believes tamping down the immune system could be a good thing. There are about 80 different autoimmune diseases, and basically, autoimmune diseases are triggered by your immune system going haywire, getting hyperactivated, and destroying certain cells and certain tissues. In multiple sclerosis, for example, the immune system suddenly begins attacking the brain and the spinal cord. Rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are similar diseases caused by the chronic inflammation associated with an immune system gone amok. The cannabinoids dampen down uh, response to um, uh, bacteria or foreign agents or uh, injury to tissues. A lot of scientists and researchers are interested in those properties of the cannabinoids in trying to see how we can suppress the immune response uh, in autoimmune disease uh, conditions. For Dr. Niagara Cotty, the research has gone far beyond treating inflammatory problems. He's narrowing in on the potential of cannabinoids to kill immune cells that have mutated and become cancerous. Once they become cancerous, they no longer die a normal cell death. Instead, they begin growing and spreading uncontrollably. We were one of the first labs to um, to demonstrate basically that not only the immune cells, the normal immune cells express these cannabinoid receptors called the CB2 receptors, but also that when these immune cells get transformed and they become cancer, to our surprise we found that these cancer cells continue to express these CB2 receptors. 
This was an exciting discovery because the CB2 receptor can act like a target for the cannabinoids. Once they bind with the receptor, they can tell the cancer cell to die. So basically telling the cells basically to commit suicide, and that's what they do. And uh, we demonstrated that that would be the mechanism by which the cannabinoids can kill the cancer, and therefore it can be used effectively as an anti-cancer agent. Dr. Niagara Cotty and his researchers were able to eradicate almost 100% of the cancer in test tubes. But they were skeptical they would see similar results when they moved on to tumors in mice. To our surprise, we found that almost uh, 25 to 30 percent of the mice completely rejected the tumor. They were completely cured. And uh, in addition, we found that the remaining mice uh, also, there was um, a significant reduction in the volume or the size of the tumors as well. The lab results have been so promising that Dr. Niagara Cotty is beginning clinical trials with leukemia patients. There's no doubt in his mind that the cannabinoids, either from the plant or lab created, will play a major role in medicine in the future. I feel that in the next five or ten years there, there is going to be exponential growth in cannabinoid research. It's an area where both the critics and the advocates agree. Scientists are now well on their way to developing medicines based on the cannabinoids. It begs the question, however, will modern medicine eventually make the marijuana plant obsolete? No, it will not. In fact, it will only enhance it. Okay, because now it's more proof that the plant really does work. Okay, and instead of spending $600 a month, on buying the pharmaceutical drug. I can grow my own plants. I don't want them to ever take the choice away because I don't know how long it's going to be before they really find out exactly what is working for me or for others. And right now having the raw plant available is the best solution because you have all of it there. You don't have just what they've isolated, just what they've decided is important now. Let's keep it in the corridors of science. Let's keep it in the FDA. Let's do what needs to be done, which is careful, longitudinal, placebo-controlled, crossover, head-to-head -head studies, and see where it falls out. But let's deliver what's really medicine. That is the individual cannabinoids. They may come across some things that are better than herbal marijuana for one thing or another, and good luck to them. I'd love that. But I never want to see compromised the capacity of people to use herbal marijuana, whether it's because the drug that they've come up with is much more expensive or it doesn't do as well or whatever the reason, that people should always have herbal marijuana available to them without any constraints from the law. Patients say for now the question is irrelevant. Science has not yet given them the opportunity to choose between an effective pill or the plant. This is something where I have no other medical alternative to treat this condition. I have exhausted all of modern medicine's alternatives and they have really screwed my body up. She says cannabis has allowed her to hold down two jobs and make plans to go back to school and finish those last credits. There is so much promise now where there was none before. Without the 10 to 12 cannabis cigarettes a day, I would not be working. I most likely would be on disability. I'd be homebound and I'd be a drain on society versus a productive member of society. The federal program that allows Irvin Rosenfeld to legally use marijuana for chronic pain was shut down in 1992. Today, he's one of a few living patients who were grandfathered in and still receive marijuana every month, courtesy of the U.S. taxpayer. Point Hatfield believes he will never gain back the muscle he lost during his cancer fight, but he got his life back, and he thinks people should not underestimate this plant just because it doesn't come with a prescription. It's medicine. It's medicine just like aspirin is or... Uh, Zoloft, Ativan, it's a medicine. Marijuana is here to stay. It is certainly here to stay as a medicine. Dr. Grinspoon says the social stigma surrounding marijuana has damaged the medical research for too long. Today, he's on the advisory board for the Marijuana Advocacy Group, Normal. 
because he believes the only way marijuana will reach its true medical potential is if it's fully legalized. He's felt this way since the 70s when he predicted the medical promise of cannabis would lead to a repeal of the prohibition in less than a decade. For years I waited for my prophecy to come true <laughs> and I despaired that I would never see it in my lifetime. And I'm 82 and I have cancer now, so I, I'm not sure I will, but at least I'm seeing, you know, uh, here, uh, this boat was dead in the water for all the years. I was running around testifying, so forth. Nothing. No and now, since medical marijuana, wow, are we making progress. Well, you're going straight to the heart of the issue, which really is the medical excuse movement is a means to get the camel's nose under the tent. <clears throat> the folks that are pushing the medical excuse movement really come from the medical legalization uh, movement. I think it's not helpful uh, to uh, brand people's motivations. Uh, it, it may be the case that there are some people out there who really are trying to legalize marijuana under the cloak of medicine. Uh, I don't happen to be one of them. Uh, uh, I'm more interested in, in seeing if there is a medical indication here, and if there is, I think it is a social responsibility to provide that uh, for people who are suffering. The scientists are not here to make um, you know, like policy decisions, but our goal is to find out the truth. To that end, the American Medical Association and the American College of Physicians have taken positions that marijuana should be moved off of Schedule 1 to make research on the cannabinoids easier. We who are involved in the science sort of wish that science would become more of a dominant driver in the, in the messaging as opposed to politics, religion and, and ignorance and fear. I like to say it's time to have more light than heat on the subject and, um, uh, and, and clear away the smoke here. When you strip away the smoke of the social and political issues, one thing is clear. After decades of controversy, conjecture, and limited research, we have arrived at last in the realm of science. We know more about the secrets of this complex plant than at any other time in history. The only question now is where that knowledge will take us. Support for this program was made possible by the Friends of Montana PBS and the University